Uh, just kick things off, my name is John Farner with Fourth Year Alumni for Biden Organizing Committee. Thanks for so much for joining us. This is probably our, our most important digital event and our final digital event uh, before next Tuesday's election. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have a lot of, of great things we're gonna talk about today and some really important announcements about the future of our organization after November 3rd, as well as we're gonna debut our next ad uh, called Truth at the very end of uh, this webinar session. But first, uh, I'm gonna introduce this cast around me and then uh, we'll introduce the governor. So we have Chris Purcell, who many of you recognize, part of the organizing committee with me. He'll be talking about our future in a little bit. Uh, Ed Cash, who you may not know, uh, worked for Governor Ridge at Department Ash, of Ash. Security. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I got They're it. Anyone. No. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'm going to start things off with uh, Genevieve Woodard Hartley, who is also a fellow organizing committee member and also worked under the leadership of Governor Ridge at the Department of uh, Homeland Security. Yeah. So good, Genevieve. All right. I, uh, yeah, I joined Homeland Security at the beginning, March 2003, and I got to work in the press office as a press assistant and got to work with all the great folks that helped create the first message of Homeland Security and the honor of working with the governor as Secretary of Homeland Security. I got to also work with Ed on various press events and help draft talking points and get to know the governor as, uh, as well as I could and I enjoyed working with him immensely. I also got to be his makeup person when he was on the Today Show early in the morning sometimes. And uh, he was just a great job working. making me look good. Thank you very much. <laughs> I tried. So, um, and I'm going to introduce Ed, who's going to lead it off. But we are so excited to have you, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Genevieve. That's my whole intro, Genevieve. <laughs> yeah, we love you, Ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, good evening, and thank you. Uh, thanks, Genevieve. Uh, thank you, Chris Purcell. John Farner, Karen Kirksey, Kelly Gansberger, Greg Jenkins, David Almasy, Sally Canfield, everyone, every, everything you guys have done for the 40th Three Alumni Group. I'm, I'm sure I forgot someone there. Um, I mean, it's been amazing to pull this together. I'm sure it's the first time this has ever really been done. A presidential alumni group has kind of crossed the aisle and supports someone else. Um, yeah, I, I had the chance uh, to work for, for Governor Ridge at Homeland Security also in March of uh, 2003. Uh, I think I had the best job ever uh, at Homeland Security because I got to travel with the governor and ahead of everywhere he went um, around the world. So I got to see firsthand um, him and how he interacted with world leaders and, and, and everything. And he was the right person for the job at the right time. Uh, we did have a little fun on the road, but we won't get into that. You know, well, you can't be around the governor after, yeah. you know, a few times he'll share some stories. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um so, um, Governor, I've had many opportunities to introduce you over the years at many of our social gatherings, um, you know, golf filings, you name it. We have a Ridge alumni group, but uh, this is a real honor to introduce you tonight uh, for, for this cause and um, in, in supporting the vice president. Uh, when I say support, uh, publicly supporting, you know, not to, not to beat up any of our colleagues, but we have all come out publicly and we've got beaten up. You know, you, you've, you've, got, you've gotten beaten up a little bit, uh, but you can take it. Um, but uh, I knew you knew this election was extremely, extremely important, and you could not sit on the sidelines uh, anymore. So you had to uh, come out publicly, of course, uh, having being in a big swing state, that's uh, very important. Um, you know, you're a well-known uh, figure, lifelong Republican, so this is one of the first times uh, you have probably uh, supported the other aisle um, on the other aisle, but uh, it's huge. Um, Governor, you have, you have really done it all. Uh, serve your country in Vietnam, uh, six, term, six terms as uh, a congressman, uh, two terms of governor of Pennsylvania. You, you're not the only 43, everyone knows that he was the 43rd governor of Pennsylvania. So when we talk about 43, you're also 43. <laughs> Um, you know, first Homeland Security Advisor and our uh, first Secretary of Homeland Security. And, uh, you, you know, you and I have chatted about this, but if you went to a higher office, you, you would have been great. And a lot of people don't know this, but there was a Ridge uh, for President Button out there, you know, uh, in 2008, you know, so. <laughs> so. You're not only ubiquitous, you're incorrigible. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, there are not many people in this world um, like Tom Ridge these days. Um, Governor, you are a true American patriot and uh, a great friend of so many, and um, it is a real honor to uh, introduce you uh, once again uh, tonight to this group 
uh, with one week uh, left in the election. So uh, my good friend, everyone's good friend, uh, Governor Tom Rich. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ed. Uh, an extraordinary introduction. I'm most grateful. But if you take a look at my uh, career, every step along the way, I was aided and abetted by a lot of other really fine, wonderful, exceptional people who were committed to doing what was the right thing in their minds and in their hearts at the time in support of me. So uh, a lot of accolades go, a lot of tributes come in my direction, but I never consider them to be personal. You can only enjoy that kind of career without great people around you whose judgment you trust. And, uh, and Ed and you and everybody on this uh, group whether you work directly for me or work for President Bush, I'm very pleased to be included in the 43 alum group. Um, you know, I've often thought about um, that relationship and that opportunity for service. And I suspect, suspect that you all look back in those days and are grateful for that opportunity of service, not just in the position but for whom and with whom you were working. You know, President Bush was, uh, did a lot of tough and occasionally controversial things. We know that. They didn't necessarily um, agree with everything he did, but one thing we knew, know for a fact, in his head and in his heart, it was always the right thing to do. And we know for a fact that he never held his finger in the air to determine which way the wind was blowing so we could secure a political advantage because of whatever that decision might be. So when you talk about just basic integrity and empathy and competence, we're all where we need to be. But on top of that, the fact that you're willing to go public in this kind of support and the first time you've ever voted for a Democrat president and clearly the first time I've ever voted for one speaks volumes to your character. You know, I said to somebody the other day and they kind of guffawed at it, you're not born a Republican or Democrat, you're born an American. And every once in a while, you gotta forget the label and understand its country first. And so I don't have to make a closing argument to you. You've already heard it in your own head and decided what that argument is without any input or encouragement from yours truly. The one visual I have in my mind because of the opportunities for leadership that have been given to me over the years is President Bush is standing on that pile of debris post 9-11 and then later on throwing that strike at Yankee Stadium. And I've often wondered if whether or not we would be at this position if we felt that the incumbent president's response to crisis was anywhere close would it need to be and what we would expect it what we would expect from a president of the united states symbolism is important i gotta tell you i cut a lot of ribbons as governor it's nice to be there in the good times when people are celebrating but that's not how you define leadership I spent the past uh, several weeks, in addition to trying to keep those in authority, respond to crisis that really defines their leadership. Now, we can differ on foreign policy. We can differ on a lot of things. And we can say that the president seems to have abandoned basic principles within the Republican Party. And I, I was a Ronald Reagan Republican. I was like an 80 or 85 percent Republican. But I always believed that the admonition that uh, the uh, I think it was a, a, a cabinet member or a parliamentary member, Lord Acton, once said, I don't owe you fealty to your point of view. I owe you my best judgment, not universe agreement. Just because you agree, I owe you my best judgment. Well, our best judgment has been, and I was, and I was an 85% Republican, but I didn't always agree with the judgment of the party. But that's not even important now. The important part is, is leadership in crisis, at least in my mind. And let me leave you with this visual. A president going to front of CDC and say, this is what we've learned from the Chinese and the epidemiologist. And this is why we think it's important for you who are Americans. You're tough, you're smart, you're resilient, 
uh, that uh, line, I forget what the movie was, but you can handle the truth even if, uh, if, 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 uh, if, if the lawyer, if Nicholson can say it and the lawyer doesn't handle it, you can handle the truth. Uh, the truth is, is that uh, this leader, this man has failed during times of crisis. And if there's anything, anything I think endemic to the party is individual accountability and responsibility. And for him to suggest that this is a fraud, that is, is a hoax, it just kind of, uh, well, you've already agreed to that. You, you, you've hoisted the flag of support. And I'm just pleased to, not to make the closing argument, you didn't need it. The jury, can, this, this jury of a couple hundred already rendered your decision. I'm here to just put an exclamation point on and say, I think you've done the right thing. And I applaud for your courage. And at the end of the day, uh, that speaks to your heart, your head, and your patriotism. And I'm very pleased to join you. Thank you. And let me start things off real quick. If anybody that's attending and watching this, uh, you have any questions for the governor, please go ahead and submit them either using the chat or Q&A functions. Uh, we can read those to the governor and, uh, and funnel any questions you may have regarding um, his comments, anything you've read, or just share some, some memories of, of his service, either to Pennsylvania or our nation. Governor, in reading your op-ed you penned for the Philadelphia Inquirer, I, I love the comparison you made, and you mentioned it today again, with President Bush standing on the pile of, of rubble uh, immediately after uh, the tragic events of September 11th, 2001. And you made that equation of just imagine what we would, the experience we would have had as a nation if President Trump would have gone to the CDC and acted responsibly and led by example by putting on a mask and calling for unity, how we can come together as a nation. You, you were governor during September 11th and you stood next to President Bush during one of the most trying times that our nation has ever faced next to dealing with this pandemic. Um, can you go into a little bit more details on, on your thoughts when, when penning that in your op-ed? Well, those of you, many of you probably didn't read the op-ed, but I was concerned about then newly announced candidate Trump's character and his mindset long before he was nominated. I don't think prisoners of war lack courage. If there's someone to condemn them for somebody that can't tell you what foot he had the bone spur on, really turned me off completely. I don't think all Mexicans are rapists and drug pushers, although we do have a serious immigration problem, but I don't think that's the way you handle it. I don't, I mean, the list went on and on. I mean, he condemned a judge who had an adverse opinion against him because of ethnicity, and the list goes on and on. And frankly, and then the following year, even before he got nominated, just in my mind, it got worse. So my predisposition to oppose a president, I wrote in the name of two Republican governors, by the way, I couldn't vote for Hillary too because of that she was pretty flawed. Uh, she made, anyhow, it's immaterial, it's, it's looking backwards, it's looking forwards. But I do think that symbolic efforts by presidents as, and it was more than symbolism, it was a statement. When the president said, President Bush said, we'll overcome this, we'll find those responsible. And then when he threw that strike, he said, and we're going to continue business as usual, which includes the World Series. And if you show up at an event, uh, as I had proffered, perhaps, if, if the, the president incumbent did, the, the incumbent would have, president would have said, I want the leaders of the House and Senate, R's and D's on both sides, and I want the Republican Governors Association leader and the Democrat leaders on my side. And this is what we're going to do. And so it's all about that. It's all about leadership in time of crisis. And I have some differences of opinion with regard to foreign policy, the treatment of our allies, the list goes on and on. But from, I think your video highlighted it. It's a matter of empathy. Do you really relate to the people, not just to those who elect, voted for you, but your responsibility ultimately is to consider those who voted for your opponent? Back to your basics. Long before you decided to become registered Republicans, you recognize your birthright as American. That always comes first. And then I'll, uh, I'll ask another question here. And I, we've gotten several questions from, from David, from uh, Susie and others. 
uh, Governor, if you, if you know this, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania um, uh, my, from the Harrisburg area. Uh, Middletown, Harrisburg. Middletown. Yeah. Naval Depot there, got it. Great yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was evacuated during a Three Mile Island, went to Ohio yeah. with, my, with my mother, so the whole nine yards. All eyes are on your home state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And, and, and folks are, are, are really interested in getting your thoughts on, number one, the election itself in Pennsylvania, and what, what you think will resonate among either th those voters who are leaning towards Trump and just not comfortable to do what you've done and show some leadership and, and vote for the Democratic nominee, Joe Biden. Well, I only have one vote, and I'm not sure my op-ed changed anybody's mind, but if nothing else, it was good therapy. Got it off my chest because it's been bugging me for five years. <laughs> uh, so that we'll, we'll leave it at that. But here, here's the state of play. And again, I'm not as qualified to respond to that very important question as people who have been around me for years who had a better sense politically and a better network than I do. But here's, I think, the state of play. In central Pennsylvania and western Pennsylvania, I see absolutely, at least see, no diminution in Trump support. I mean, his zealots are his zealots. I mean, he's got them. The question in my mind is what it comes down to three. First of all, I think it's a toss up. Forget a seven or eight point lead or five point lead that Biden has. Throw it out the window. I'll be the most surprised, and I'll be happy to apologize to all of you if he wins by five or six points. <laughs> but here's where I think the challenge is, and I can't tell you what the answer is. Will those unions, first of all, people voted for him because they thought neither Republican or Democrat Party were connecting with him, particularly in the burbs and in rural America. And by the way, that's not wrong. Because I don't think the Republican Party is connected with a lot of people for the past uh, 8, 10, 12 years, even though after the Romney defeat under Reese Priebus, they did that uh, post-election analysis, said, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this. We've done none of it. And matter of fact, I think we've run in the opposite direction. So putting that aside, let's back to PA. Whether or not he can sustain, even at a modest level, the kind of union support he had in 2016 remains to be seen. My sense is, at least in northwestern Pennsylvania, I don't think he's going to lose much there. Uh, the fracking question in western PA, uh, the uh, challenges, by, I don't know how people are going to respond to Biden and say, I didn't say I was going to ban fracking, and the Trump repeatedly saying, yes, you did, yes, you did. So it's a, who do you believe there? Women, particularly in the suburbs, particularly in Philadelphia, I don't know. I think there's a lot of things he's done personally uh, and how he's responded and shown little or no empathy for victims of COVID. I think it's not, I think that troubles a lot of people, but I think I've been no, and I don't want to sound sexist about it, but that, I think that troubles moms and grandmoms and, and, uh, and, and, and people who are worried about their kids. Uh, we know that, and I think that could have a, uh, an effect on uh, the female vote. And the question becomes whether or not there, you get a turnout within the minority population, particularly in Philadelphia. I remember uh, the turnout in Philadelphia, I thought in 2016 for her, was modest at best. And whether the vice president and now President Obama can generate a significant increase in, uh, in minority turnout. I think that'll be decisive. I still think it's a, you're lucky it's a one or 2% victory and I hope I'm wrong. Hey governor, just quick, quick question. You and I both work with a lot of law enforcement um, around the country and I mean, I'm getting beat up left and right. How can you support Biden? Trump's pro law enforcement, he's not. I mean, my, my question is, you know, streets will be safer because Obama, Trump is throwing fuel on the fire in, in these cities, empowering his supporters that go out there with guns in Kenosha and these other places. How have you been answering this? I mean, I've, I've been looking for that, you know, it's, it's like, how can you support him? It's, it's, it's every single day now, you know. Well, I'll give you an anecdote today that I think uh, speaks to uh, our concern about that. One, I have a strong belief in the 700, 800,000 plus men and women 
wearing uniforms around the country. They are ultimately how you secure the country. Can't secure the country inside the beltway. You just can't. So you need the men and women back home. We know that. Secondly, his, they started boarding up windows, windows and doors in Washington today. And they've done it apparently in other cities around the country because they're fearful of protest post-election. And my view is the toxic environment has been primarily, not exclusively, but the toxicity in this political environment is generated by only one person. That's the president. So if you truly support men and women in uniform in state and local law enforcement, how in God's name could you create such unrest in the community, particularly among your supporters, to suggest that they may show up armed and angry if you don't win on, the, on November 3rd. And let's face it, Mr. President, it's pandemic. There's gonna be millions and millions of votes cast absentee, and we will not be able to determine nope, who the absolute winner, the legitimate winner is with all the votes counted. So I, I kind of throw, if you're in favor of law enforcement, why do you stir up social unrest, which puts them in harm's way from the get-go? I don't know. And, and frankly, if you're in law enforcement and you, you've had to deal maybe with white supremacists or the extremes, do you agree that among white supremacists, there's some really fine people there? What? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I just got to remind them who they're, who they're trying to defend. And I understand. And the Democrats didn't help. They were the crazies in a couple of those communities that say they want to defund the police. I don't know who the hell is going to protect and defend their communities if they take the police off the streets, but I, it is a challenge. And I'm hopeful that uh, the law enforcement community can see through that uh, very shallow rhetoric and understand he's created more problems for them than not. Governor, you, you started the Department of Homeland Security as the first secretary. Um, what do you make of, of what's become of, of the department under the current leadership, which is, of course, all acting, um, and, and kind of what do you see as the, the big threats right now that, that the, the agency isn't handling very well? Well, first of all, I regret that the secretary is only acting. That in of itself is a message, maybe even to the secretary, whether he knows it or not. I regret also that, uh, the, as I am told, there are quite a few senior management positions that go uh, unfilled. I also have reason to believe that some of the people in critical positions were forced out because they happened to have a different point of view as to the ethics of certain kinds of decisions being made. So I'll leave it at that. Ultimately, I think the president has politicized DHS because he's talked publicly about putting them in positions that I believe in good conscience that they're uncomfortable with. I also believe that by sending in the militia, I called it the militia, by sending DHS into Portland when you had so many other law enforcement agencies that could handle that, I think he's tried to uh, politicize it much to the detriment of uh, the good men and women that's, that work for me and still working there. It's not a political, but look at the mission statement. I remember when we did the first, uh, we wrote our first vision statement. And the first thing we said in the vision statement was protect our freedoms. And it's kind of turned it into a political agency. And I don't think it's consistent with the mission. And I certainly don't think it's something that majority, maybe 99.9% .9 of the men and women in Homeland Security embrace. They just like to go about their jobs without interruption and without the politicization of the department. And unfortunately, given his political profile and what he thinks can drive votes to him and his base, they've ended up being part of the political alchemy that he's created, uh, much to the disservice of the men and women that work there. I, I, I don't like it at all, obviously, but we'll see. I feel bad. I can't imagine what the morale is. They're good people who work hard there, whether it's in uh, ICE, in uh, Border, Border Patrol, whether it's in R&D, Coast Guard, you name it. You and I know well, there are some great people working there. But they're in, it, it, there's no other cabinet agencies that are at the epicenter of four years of politics. It's pretty, 
difficult for them, I'm sure, to deal with professionally, let alone personally. Uh, Governor, uh, one, just to follow up on your comments there, we've gotten several questions regarding uh, the efficacy of the Homeland Security Department because it has become very politicized and that possibly opens us up to threats, both foreign and domestic, and not even talking about the pandemic, I'm talking about cybersecurity threats, really making the United States vulnerable to, the, to those threats. What, what are your thoughts on what needs to be done moving forward with, with getting us out of this cycle we're in, 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 in the department? Well, I think to the department's great credit, I have every reason to believe they're working as closely as they possibly can with both state and locals with regard to election security. Uh, that's part of their mission. We decided a long time ago that's critical infrastructure. Protecting critical infrastructure is part of our mission. And I'm quite confident that uh, they're doing everything they can to buttress that. I'm not so worried about tampering with vote tallies and that sort. I think the big game is uh, the disinformation on the web and kind of affect outcomes through by changing opinions. But I'm pretty confident that that's exactly what they're doing. I do think the larger mission uh, would be enhanced considerably if they fill some of those critical positions. Uh, listen, it's a huge enterprise. We've gone from 180,000 to 240,000. And I'm not quite sure what the other 60,000 how they've added to the effectiveness of the department. I know ICE needed more people, the Border Patrol needed more people, maybe the cyber side. I'm not sure that bigger is necessarily meant better and uh, time will tell. I also think one of the challenges that DHS has had and will continue to have is this voluminous extraterritorial congressional oversight. It's just so tough. Uh, to get the job done when I'm quite confident that a lot of people are up there on the hill testifying all the time. But back to the bigger question, I believe in 2020, given the tools they have and their mission is to work closely with the people responsible for critical infrastructure, I'm pretty confident they're doing all they can possibly do with state and locals to secure this election. Whether it's enough remains to be seen. Given the ubiquity of the internet, you can't control it all. We know that. Well, let's talk about the election real quick, and because you've been very vocal on, on election, election, the integrity of this election, yeah. uh, you've, been, you've been a leader in, in that in that realm, and a lot of eyes again are on Pennsylvania and, and counting those ballots that may come in after election day, but are postmarked before, similar to how we file our tax returns. You know, I think you mentioned earlier about we may not know for a, a while after this election, but just how important is it for us to continue to stay focused on these positive messages on the integrity of this election to our friends, family, and those that support Joe Biden's candidacy? So I'm going to put an exclamation point around how important it is. Multiple exclamation points. You should know that three of my successors and I are doing an interview tomorrow with uh, today and probably run on Thursday morning to talk very specifically about the safety and security of the electoral process. The hype and the anxiety created by a president who suggested that uh, if you don't know the outcome of the election on November 3rd, it's tantamount to fraud flies in the face of the reality that COVID-19 means millions more are going to vote by absentee. And the notion that you look at November 3rd is something other than the last day you can vote in person, not the final day where the outcome is to be determined is somewhat problematic. And I think the four secretaries, the four of us, are going to try to disabuse in this conversation, which is rather historic, two R's, two D's, Chertoff, Napolitano, and Johnson Ridge tried to deal with this issue uh, on a national broadcast because I think it's a, there's a lot of anxiety about the legitimacy of the election. And Ben Ginsburg, I don't know if you saw his op-ed in the Washington Post, said clearly this is a man who's a strong, he's a great, able, great lawyer, election law lawyer, conservative Republican lawyer, credentials unblemished, unchallenged, said this notion of fraud that the president has promoted, and I'll use the president's own word, not Ben's, fake news. 
We just have to keep repeating that and ask people to be patient. Let's let every vote be counted and certainly be peaceful. Yeah, certainly a busy uh, few days after for lawyers, I take it. You know, he's going to do everything he can and his team to, to try to steal this, right? Um, I just, it just, they've just created so much anxiety around it, which is just, it's, just, it's, beyond, it's beyond my comprehension. Uh-huh. That's what it is. It's beyond my comprehension that an incumbent president would try to dismantle the most fundamental institution in uh, this, uh, this imperfect uh, republic that we have and continue to try to improve this democracy. The most fundamental institution of the elections. We've had, uh, we've had some questions from, from several people. I know you mentioned this briefly in your op-ed that you're not sure what happens next for the Republican Party. And, uh, but we, one question that we get all the time as, a, as an organizing committee, as a group is, what happens next? You know, if, if no matter what the outcome of the election is, is Trumpism here to stay? And, you know, our response is we need to just remain active. We need to remain vocal and active for what we feel is right. And whether that's working with the Republican Party, Democratic Party, we just want to make sure that these values of empathy, compassion continue to move forward. What, what are your thoughts? I know that, you know, the election is a week away. I, we don't want to play if the Democrats take control of the Senate or if Biden wins or Trump wins. But what do you think is next for it for the GOP? Have you given any thought to that at all? Very little. Worried about the outcome. Not so much the results, but how the country responds to it. Even if Donald Trump loses the election, his influence is pervasive and will be sustained to the extent that it can be sustained and in what form remains to be seen. So it would be a good idea to go back to uh, the 2016 uh, analysis of why we lost. I think it has more relevance to any analysis, maybe even the analysis if Trump loses as to why he lost, and maybe take lessons learned and figure out whether or not uh, the party, the Republican Party as we knew it, uh, can sustain itself in the future, uh, or whether or not whether or not it's extinct, and we got to start from scratch. I'd like to, I'd like to start with the base of principles and move on, but time will tell. Right now, frankly, I'm focused on outcome and how the country responds to it. We've always transferred transferred power if that's to occur. Yeah, peacefully. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not looking too far beyond that, candidly. I'm going to look at look looking at the questions here. Uh, someone someone asked this, and um, and and I'll just say uh, when I met the vice president for the first time about a year and a half ago, you've got like you know 10, 15 seconds with them, and you immediately say, "I'm like I worked in the Bush administration for Tom Ridge," and he was like, "Oh, Tom Ridge, uh, very good things to say about you." What is uh, your relationship with him over the over the past years? Have you, have you guys chatted or you run into each other at events? I mean, how is that relationship? Have they reached out to you at all, the campaign, if you're able to say? Well, no, they, they uh, certainly, uh, I think, appreciated the, uh, the op-ed. And I mean, let me tell you about the Vice President. He and my dear friend John McCain were friends, which I find a very interesting juxtaposition because their views on foreign policy couldn't be any further apart, I don't think. But I was in their presence on multiple occasions when they introduced each other at different functions. And in spite of some basic disagreements, reasonably the role of America in the global community, there was such enormous respect, and I would say a pretty sincere friendship between the two of them was kind of reminded of the relationship that Judge Scalia had with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 180 degrees apart. They enjoyed a great friendship, which including opera and vacationing together. So when I take a look at somebody like uh, Vice President Biden, I take a look at someone who, one, I think respects the institutions of government, respects the rule of law. Um, I, I may not agree with him on very much. I mean, depending on some of the things he said during the campaign, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond troubled. I just flatly opposed to. But uh, before I worry about policy, I want to worry about character and integrity and truthfulness. And so I think it's an interesting uh, 
my relationship with him has been at a distance, but it's been a respectful one. And I very much appreciate it. But I, we, the Allegheny College in the middle of my old congressional district had a civility award. And one year they asked me if I knew John McCain. I said, of course, we got elected together in 82. They asked me if I knew Vice President Biden. I said, yeah, a little bit, multiple sources. Would they accept the civility award? Because we wanted strong partisans who disagreed, but who conducted business in a civil manner. And of course, uh, I called John, and one of the moments that they had talked to John about was when someone tried to get him involved in a, a religious debate, well, during the campaign against Obama. Well, isn't he just some crazy Muslim, blah, blah, blah? And John said, no, he's got, regardless of his religion, we just have differences of opinion as to how the government ought to be structured and operate, blah, blah, blah. And the reason they looked to Biden was because when Hillary Clinton said, oh, those Republicans, they're our enemies. And Joe Biden said, they're not our enemies. Our opponents. We can get along with them. They can be friends. We just have differences of opinion. That's the kind of leadership we need for the next four years. And then hopefully, if he prevails, we'll flip it to the Republican column after that. <laughs> uh, G- Governor, I'll ask you one last thing. And, and uh, first of all, thank you for taking the time tonight to talk to all of us. Um, now, we, we are all organized under the banner of alumni working for the Bush administration. And as we, as we march into the next six days before next Tuesday, what, what are your marching orders for us? Uh, what, what, what do you, what do you, if we, if you could say one thing for us to do, what would that be? I, I think you stand your ground and to the extent, well, obviously you're going to stand your ground. You've been doing it now for a long, long time. The extent that you can reach out, to those who you think may be undecided. By the way, I think it's down to a couple percentage points. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think people have dug in for a lot of reasons. I mean, this is a, I just did a quick interview with the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, a reporter, and he said, this, he thought that this was an election very similar to Lincoln's re-election when it was really a referendum on the incumbent more than policy. And I said, I happen to agree. I think that's a referendum on leadership in crisis. Because there's a lot of people I think, but for coronavirus would have been leaning toward voting for Trump. Hey, they like the taxes going down. They like this mythical game he's playing with China, even though it's a much more complicated relationship than just trade, blah, blah, blah. But I think until coronavirus, until the pandemic, people were leaning in that direction. So I guess I'm not gonna give you any marching orders. You've been marching to, you've been marching in unison for a long time without me, I'm just kind of joining at the end of the parade. But the extent that there might be some uncertain or undecided voters out there, your, your communication with them might be helpful because I think it's a very, very narrow margin. Because I think, would I say 95, 96, 97% of people already made up their mind. At least I well, think. It, it's folks like you, Governor, and, and your voice along with groups like ours that, that carry weight among those Republicans who have never voted for a Democratic candidate in their lives. And so we cannot thank you enough, having served as a secretary, the first secretary of Homeland Security, and as a leader among equals in the administration when we all serve together. We, we cannot thank you enough for, for your leadership, not only for your time tonight, but coming out publicly because I, we know it's a tough decision, but it's the right one well, uh, yeah, for, for the United States. I appreciate that. I'd like to remind everybody I've been blessed with a great political career, and at no point in my life I've been able to do anything worth doing without a lot of help from a lot of people, including my service as DHS and governor, even back to my days as a squad leader in Vietnam. So I appreciate the kind words, but uh, uh, you know, you're only as good as the people around you, and I've just been blessed in my life in public service to have some of the best and finest and uh, most ethical and thoughtful and capable people you could ever possibly imagine, including many of the men and women on this email. So I'm, I congratulate you uh, up front. Your voices will be heard, and I appreciate having the opportunity to just have the chance to say, well done, Americans. You're great patriots. Thanks for your service. Thank you. And you're more than welcome to stay on. Uh, you, can, you can cut out. I'm actually going to introduce my colleague on, on the committee, Chris, uh, Chris Purcell, <laughs> We're going to talk about uh, the next steps uh, for 43 alumni after November 3rd. Chris. Yeah, thanks, John. So I just want to take a couple minutes and, and, and just start by saying, you know, we're very grateful for everyone's support. 
Um, you know, we, we never set out to raise or spend millions of dollars, uh, but, but, you know, we want to be thankful for all of the, the small donors who've, who've chipped in and we've put in um, every cent that that's come in. We've, we've either uh, we've put directly into this effort. So we're very appreciative. And, and of course we want to be um, especially grateful to those who, who stepped out publicly um, on our website right now, we have the names of more than 360 Bush alumni who have endorsed Joe Biden. Um, the easy thing to do would have been to stay quiet. And, you know, we're, we're thankful that, that you all have, have been willing to, to take this stand with us. Um, and let's not forget, we also have the pledges of, of another 150 to 200 Bush alumni who, who will vote for Joe Biden, um, including uh, several more cabinet secretaries who, who have indicated that as well. So, you know, I think together we've, we've all made a difference and, um, you know, we have seven more days of, of hard work. So, so keep talking to people, keep, um, you know, keep making calls. If you want to, you know, help the campaign with, with their phone banking or anything like that, please do so. Um, you know, let's make sure people get out to vote. Let's make sure that, that, you know, Donald Trump and his, his henchmen aren't out there uh, stealing votes in, in places like Pennsylvania. Um, you know, with, with, what there's, with, uh, with what they're doing in the legislature there. So, um, and I just want to close by saying, you know, a number of people have asked, okay, so, so what's next? What happens after the election, you know, no matter who wins? You know, I think, I think what we want to do is, is let's remember what President Bush's charge to all of us was, and that was to stay involved and to stay true to our values. Um, and so I, I think that's what we've done with this organization, even though, uh, it is in support of a, a, the Democratic candidate. Um, so, so what we're going to do is, is continue under a new brand of, of 43 Alumni for America. Uh, but what, it, what that looks like, though, is, is up to all of you. So we really do want that feedback. Um, you know, we want to know, um, you know, what you want to do after the election. So, you know, please, please stay in contact with us. Um, and, uh, and, and tell us what you think. So you can either contact us directly or through our website, which is going to be, uh, which will become uh, 43alumniforamerica.com. So, you know, the, the mission remains the same and that's, you know, restore principles of unity and tolerance, compassion and common decency in our political institutions. Um, so, uh, so, you know, we, we hope you all will, will stay involved in your own ways. Um, and, um, you know, we, we can't expect things to go smoothly over the next couple of weeks. So, um, you know, the forces of Trumpism and, and white nationalism, they aren't, they aren't going to go quietly. So, um, you know, we need to, we need to continue to stand firm. Um, so let's all stay in touch. Thank you all. Thanks, Chris. And, um, you know, this is our last digital event and we're going to close things out with our new ad. Uh, we played team 46 at the beginning of this webinar. Uh, it was our first digital ad produced, actually the second one, the first one we did by ourselves. Uh, uh, Team 46, we, we did by ourselves. So the next one is called Truth. Hey, John, uh, can I just yeah. say something real quick? Yeah, absolutely, Governor. You know, when I left the uh, president's cabinet, uh, one of my favorite and more important roles in the nonprofit world is uh, the National Organization on Disability. And I know a little bit about sign language before. It's, I won't bore you in the details, but uh, I just want to applaud you and this group uh, for your incredible commitment. But uh, with American Sign Language and uh, the hearing impaired, uh, no sense in clapping. So <laughs> thank I, you very I much. Applaud you. Thank <laughs> you. For me, thank you for giving me the opportunity to applaud you and your team. And God bless each and every one of you. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I, we're all, Chris is wearing his shirt. I'll put on my hat. We're all going to go out and wear our colors over the next week uh, for Joe Biden. And uh, I can't thank this organizing committee enough, uh, folks like Governor Ridge, everyone that helped us out. You know who you are. Everyone from our first webinar we did with Rosario, Greg, and Sally, uh, to everyone that had private phone calls with us, the weekly meetings. There's a lot of efforts going into this. We've all made lifelong friends. And I've never seen a group of individuals come together organically to support a cause we believe so much in. And for those of you who have viewed our webinars, thank you so much. And whatever we can do to help you get the vote out, just please let us know. Reach out to us via our website. Talk to us after November 3rd. 
carry forth the president's charge to, to stay politically active and vocal. That is what we're doing, carrying on the legacy that we all learned in working under his, Governor Ridges, the rest of the cabinets, and all of our colleagues' leadership. So with all that said, thank you very much. And without further ado, here is truth. We believe in America. An America united by truth, not divided by lies. Most of us are lifelong Republicans, but we're Americans first. We know truth isn't liberal or conservative, it's just truth. We must elect a president who understands that and who embodies the values of our country. All of us serve with the 43rd president. But come election day, every last one of us on this team is voting for Biden. Let's put Joe Biden in the White House. He'll be a solid 46. Well done.